you called Karen's story heartbreaking, but how common is a story like Karen's in PPS schools where she at the end was not deported, but her father was going through immigration proceedings. He sends her back to their original country. Um, you know, how common is that? Well, unfortunately, uh, over the last several years, we've seen an escalation of these kinds of stories. Uh, I think last spring I was pretty vocal about how our families were being impacted, uh, how a particular parent of a student, um, but now we're seeing examples of students themselves uh, having to be removed from their classroom learning. And my fear is, um, how far is this gonna go? Uh, it's parents, it's students and employees. Um, who's next? Is it the Nigerian physics teacher who's been with us for a decade? Um, is it the Muslim teacher? Um, there's something that we have to acknowledge about this climate of fear. Uh, it has a very real impact on the work in our schools. You've been very vocal about this. Uh, you know, prior administration has been vocal about this. Once a student is in a school, they're safe. But so much can happen outside of school. So what do you do? How do you help these families as superintendent? Well, one thing we do is we have very clear protocols um, about what level of cooperation or lack of cooperation uh, we'll be uh, taking. Uh, but we need to maintain uh, a close partnership with uh, many community-based organizations uh, and other resources that, that can support our students, our families, and apparently now our employees um, to make sure uh, that there's somebody there uh, who, who can help them navigate these new troubled waters. The policy states if, you know, before ICE were to enter any school, they'd have to notify you in person. Talk about why is that a policy and has that ever happened here? Um, it is true. Uh, if a, uh, an agent were to present themselves uh, at the front door of one of our school communities, uh, they have to contact uh, my office and uh, they will have a, a, a clear response uh, ready for them. Uh, schools. Uh, like churches <laughs> should, should be sanctuaries. Uh, we're, we're in the business of taking care of children and youth. Uh, we're, we're not a place uh, where uh, agents should uh, come in uh, and, and make arrests or apprehensions. Uh, we're, we're, we're never going to be uh, accomplices uh, in, in those cases, ever at least not under my watch. Woodlawn has said if a ICE official comes to the door, they would go into lockdown. Um, why is that protocol for your schools? Well, a primary responsibility we have, and I think every family in Portland would expect, is that we keep a safe uh, school environment. Uh, we're not going to have uh, agents coming in and disrupting that piece within our schools uh, where, where for at least the school day we want everybody focused on learning. Uh, they're going to have to do their business elsewhere. Does PPS keep track of undocumented students or undocumented staff members? We do not as a school district collect, track, monitor uh, anybody's immigration status. Uh, we are not in the business of uh, checking those things. Uh, you don't see that in any documentation that uh, we request that families provide. Uh, we're going to serve every child that comes through our doors. Um, that's just a matter of practice for us. A lot of critics say having undocumented students in a school system is, is too much of a financial burden. What do you say to that? Well, uh, I'm a lifelong educator, uh, so um, I'm, I'm going to serve any child that walks through the door, uh, whether I'm a teacher or during my time as a principal or now as a school superintendent. Uh, I know what's a drain on our country, it's ignorance. 
And so I can't think of a better antidote than making sure everybody actually uh, has a well-rounded education. So uh, it's important that we have an educated populace. I think what's lacking is civic discourse. Um, I think every dollar we invest in children and youth uh, pays dividends uh, in our ability to uh, be strong community, uh, be a strong state, uh, be a strong country. When not all students are afforded uh, an equitable, high quality educational opportunity, we see the effects of that. Uh, we can talk at the, about the school to prison pipeline. Uh, we can talk about what happens when uh, public education educators don't have the supports uh, readily available to offer their students, um, especially diverse students, uh, whether it's language uh, or, or of a different uh, uh, race, for instance. So uh, it's true uh, when we don't make investments uh, in all students, uh, in every student, uh, we pay the price. Uh, later. You know, I'm not going to be breaking any new ground with you on this, but a lot of the comments after the story were, you know, Karen's dad broke the law and tell the kids in her class that's why she's not here anymore. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, I think um, we want to have a response to, that's developmentally appropriate. I think what we saw in your segment is the struggle that her teacher had in trying to describe why one of their cherished classmates is no longer sitting at her desk. Uh, and I think he shared that um, she's likely going to a new school. And I really hope that that's true because what I would not want is for any child not to have the opportunity to learn um, and so, for me, this isn't a story about a child um, having done something criminal or a family, uh, and we have many examples of this, who have gone through extreme measures uh, to provide an opportunity for their children, which I think any parent would be willing to take a risk for. Uh, I, don't, I don't consider it a criminal act. Um, that they want their child to be able to read and write. Why is this so personal for you? I mean, you can tell, I mean, you, you can just tell talking with you. I mean, why, why are you so passionate about this? Well, um, it's personal for a lot of different reasons. Um, part of it is visible as to why it might be uh, personal for me. Um, but it's, it's also been 25 plus years of living and working embedded in communities of color. Uh, and one of the reasons that I became an educator is to make sure uh, all children, um, every single student, uh, some who oftentimes look like me, um, have the same kind of equal opportunity that is public education's promise. Uh, it's hard to be uh, an effective educational leader if you're silent on issues that are affecting your ability to serve your core mission. Um, if my job is to keep my students safe and bad policy is impacting on that or outside forces are infringing on the school environment, um, I think any family would expect us to address it. Um, and so not only is it sort of a function of my role per se, um, but it also strikes it sort of a deep personal belief about um, helping to support children and young adults uh, grow into critical thinkers who can make this, I believe, a better world. And because sitting in our kindergarten classrooms could be that next engineer that makes life better for all of us, or inventor, or president, or mayor, um, or teacher. And um, I just don't think we should be robbing children of that opportunity.
this is such a polarizing issue. I mean, I, I've saw it in the comments. I've seen it, you know, of course, online. Sure. Just what do you say to critics? I mean, critics are very vocal about this, sure. that schools should not be sanctuary districts or, you know, people broke the law. I mean, what do you say to these critics? Sure. Um, I'm so appreciative that you've been able to capture uh, the story of one school um, because I think it has uh, emerged f for folks um, a visual uh, description, hearing those stories. Um, I would challenge anybody not to be moved um, by the episode with Karen or any of the others uh, because it's, it's part of our day-to-day -day here as a school system. Uh, that's one school. Uh, we have 80 others and every day stories like that are taking place. Uh, our, our responsibility, our privilege, is to make sure every day is better than the last for each of our children and, and young adults uh, that we serve. Um, I think uh, certainly people uh, fall along partisan lines um, and believe that uh, schools should not be taking a, a political stance. Uh, trust me, uh, we would prefer not to. Um, but a superintendent shouldn't be silent on uh, developing legislation. Um, it shouldn't be, a superintendent shouldn't be silent on his or her advocacy for resources or, or things that will benefit our students. Um, and certainly there's an expectation that we keep safe learning environments. Um, and I think this is an example of uh, politics invading our classroom um, is, is in some ways one way I could describe it. Uh, it it's affecting the, the climate and the safety. Uh, it's affecting our ability to deliver educational services as an employer. Um, and it's certainly heightening the anxiety from the current students, current employees, current families are feeling, and I'm just wondering, um, when does that get better? Because we seem to be headed down a journey where it appears to be getting worse. And at some point, uh, it seems like greater and greater numbers of, of people, of students, of the adults who work in our public education system are gonna be impacted. Uh, and I think that goes to my question, who's next?